Facebook. Need some more of this Bruce song. Are we officially live? We are officially live. <laughs> and we're about to be live on Facebook as well. <laughs> Cynthia Bowser. Yeah, cool. You know Cynthia. You're right. All right, there it is. Okay, cool. Wow, well, look at that. Oh, Cynthia. Hey. <laughs> All right, very cool. So we'll let the numbers kind of pile on. There's uh, Steve Hewitt and Martha from Columbus. And us again, right on. Thank you. They've been with us like this whole time. So, Dr. Raymond, Nancy, Joel's on. Hey, Joel. Jason, Eva. Oh, cool. I know we've got people joining us over on the other side on Facebook as well. So, people, huge Pianetta fan over there on Facebook. <laughs> that would probably be my uh, squadron mate, Goomba, <laughs> best friend in the world. <laughs> uh, looks like we got a bunch of people watching over there. Very cool. All right. I'm going to come back into the Zoom thing here. All right. We'll wait just another minute or two and, uh, and get going. Hopefully everyone's having a good day, though. We'll get rolling. Right on. I'm having a good day. Good. When yeah, better. Be a lot worse. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we could be on a boat. <laughs> yeah. No. We could be in the middle of the I.O. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> a little bit of drinking. Cool. Got Scott Oberg on again. What's up, Scott? Good seeing you. Cow. Glass of Aspera. That goes back a ways. Wow. Cool, cool. All right. Let's get rolling. All right. So start now. Everyone, Chris Toronto again with the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance. Thank you again for joining us for another Paso Wine Hangout. Uh, we got a cool one today. Well, I say that every time. I know, I know, but maybe that's just Paso, right? We're pretty cool over here. <laughs> Even cooler than you think, I guess. Uh, but our group today uh, is a little nod to the military, um, and uh, as it ha happens, uh, they're all Navy guys, too, and so these, these guys are a lot of fun. Um, we had a really fun practice session yesterday where I kept having to tell them as they're telling their stories, like, wait, wait, save it for tomorrow. Uh, they got a lot of stories. The premise, though, of course, is not just that they're in the military and whatever, but it's going to be how that kind of ties in to uh, winemaking and how they got into it. And I'll get a little bit more into that in, in, in the intro. Uh, but first, uh, let me introduce, uh, these guys are all gonna say who they are and a uh, quick snippet about themselves and then we'll kind of get rolling. Uh, first, I'll start with Leon, Leon Tackett, Tackett Family Vineyards. Go ahead, Leon. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, Leon Tackett, I've been in Paso for 12 years now um, in business and 27, almost 28 years in the Navy. So kind of my gig. Cool. And you're located uh, where at, Leon? We're about seven miles northeast of the airport. So we're out the Pleasant Valley Wine Trail. Okay. Right on. Cool. Next, we got John Pianetta uh, with Pianetta Winery. Uh, and he's, uh, they, they, these guys are in downtown. You're, you're, but your vineyard is located up near the county line, I believe it is. John, oh, yeah. introduce yourself, please. And, and I'll uh, John Pianetta, Pianetta Vineyard and Winery. Uh, our ranch is up in San Miguel. Uh, we've got 95 acres, 79 and fine, all red. 
Our tasting room is downtown on 13th Street, about a block north of the park, where my daughter runs all the businesses. Cool, right on. And last but not least is uh, Hal, Hal Schmidt. Um, I'm fortunate enough to call Hal a friend. Uh, he actually, I make a little bit of wine on the side and Hal is like, my guy. he helps me out with everything, man. Hal, good to see you. Introduce yourself and all. So Chris, thanks a lot. Uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, run Velatus Wine. We started, I did our first vintage in 2004. Just opened a tasting room last year though. We're out on Willow Creek Road. Uh, we're just off of Vineyard. Uh, with, along with Chris and, and Rich, make our wines at Midnight Cellars. Have a small family vineyard just off the vineyard in Bethel, and just happy to be here. Right on. Cool, cool. Uh, so, as I mentioned uh, just at the beginning here, this uh, it's kind of a military theme. It's it's. Uh, I, I was I was looking at how we have so many of these personalities in Paso and that there, there's this kind of birds of a feather type of thing here, if you're noticing in these themes of these shows, mm -hmm. that so many of these, these individuals that have called Paso their home um, have these, these interesting attributes that have led them to wine, right? And today's theme is this, this kind of military theme what led them to wine? How is it that their military background, their Navy background maybe even plays a role in their winemaking or their farming? Uh, and kind of just talk. I mean, you know how it is talking to military people that you might know uh, that are maybe either retired or still kind of uh, working in, in, in somehow in the system there. They're really fun to talk to. They've got a lot of stories. And so that's why I've put this show together today. Um, Leon, you yesterday, you had said uh, something to the effect that uh, you were still actually working, but yet you got into the business at, at, a, at a point in time, though, uh, that it kind of just, it was just leading you to wine. Talk a little bit about that again. Um, well, sure. So it would have been around the 98 time frame. So the property where we're at belonged to my grandparents. They bought the place back in the 50s. And so I spent all my summers on that property. So that kind of drew me to the area to begin with. And then my grandfather had the Gewürztraminer. So I started playing with the 30 vines that he had of Gewürztraminer back in 97, 98 timeframe and just started playing around and making wine. And I was in the Navy, still had another 10 years at least in front of me. I just picked up a commission. So I had to do 10 more years as an officer. And so I just started playing with wine and just kept coming back and forth to the area. and always loved Paso to begin with. And my mentor at the time was Tom Morgan, who had um, the winery out there in Templeton, Casa de Caballos, longtime family friend. So he was guiding me along and, and also former Navy guy. He was a Navy doc. And so it just kind of was this natural progression. And then I started seeing how Paso and how the industry worked together and working in small teams in the Navy, you know, everything I did was in four and five man teams. And all of a sudden here's this little group of people in this area working together, you know, the winemakers talk, the growers talk, and everybody works together to put Paso on the map. So it just, it was a real easy fit for me anyway, at that, at that point. So, and that's what really drew me in. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I, I know, happen to know Hal's story in that you were over at Lemoore and you were coming in. When was that you were coming over and tasting wine and getting to know the area? No, I started coming over here. I was in Lamore, just south of Fresno. Uh, those that have been in the valley, sometimes in the summer, it's, it's good to come out to the coast. And so we would do that and discover the wine tasting. And for us, it was just, it was a fun place to be. Uh, as, as a pilot, I'm sure a Navy pilot, John can, uh, John can agree with me here most likely uh, that we're, we're not the most high, kind of high pollutant bunch. So it was great coming to Paso because as Leon said, everybody was friendly. They were very welcoming as a taster that knew nothing about wine. And quite honestly, in my case, when, when I offered to help, they called me back and said, yeah, come on out and we'll, we'll turn you loose on uh, our grapes and our equipment and see what happens. So it was, it was just a, a tremendous environment uh, to come out and play around with wine. Yeah, sounds like a learn by doing type of thing uh, and, and just gaining that experience. Definitely. Now, John, you have a family history of farming is the way I understand it. And you don't just happen on 95 acres. What led you to Paso and, and what led you into, into this? 
Well, like you said, uh, I do have a family uh, farming history, primarily vegetables. And then when I graduated college, uh, joined the Navy and uh, in the first 12 weeks, they uh, <clears throat> uh, break you down and build you back up, get your mind right, uh, emphasize some values that I'd had throughout my uh, family. And that's uh, honor, integrity, uh, loyalty. Oh, okay, yeah, do that. Uh, <clears throat> this is my controller now uh, putting up a picture of the original uh, people who started the Pianetta family farming. Um, when she gets the picture up there, it will be my uh, dad on the left, uh, my grandfather, and my uncle who's still alive at 94. So anyway, got in the Navy, and uh, that's, uh, I suppose, can be discussed later when we start telling sea stories, but then, um, uh, when I finished my flying career, actually, let me retrace that. Just like Leon, about 10 years before I finished my flying career, I bought this ranch, uh, piece of property, and started from scratch and uh, built it up back in 96. The winery went up in 2001. Caitlin graduated uh, poly and uh, ag management, and so she kind of took over the business back in 2004. Was obviously getting her feet wet. Didn't get a whole lot of guidance from dad, but uh, a lot of support, so a lot of OJT. I'm sorry? I just did. Uh, my dad's on the left, that's the tall guy, and uh, my grandfather's in the middle, that's Ernest, and then uh, my uncle on the right. You know, when, we, when grandpa came to that property, and that is the original property, we were farming with horses. So this picture was actually taken by a cat dealer because that was something new during that time, and certainly new to us. And then as we uh, moved south to uh, Fremont and grew to about 1,500 acres, uh, we ended up with John Deere and rubber because we could pick implements up and just drive down the road. Anything with cat, uh, yours truly, at a very young age and definitely not with the proper license was driving the uh, semi to, to deliver the cows and wide equipment to various ranches. Um, how I ended up in Paso? Well, I started uh, going north through Napa, Chico, came down through uh, uh, Fresno, Porterville. I was looking for nuts or uh, vines and I have a couple of cousins that are in the uh, nut business over in uh, particularly almonds, almonds over in uh, Merced and uh, didn't like what I saw as far as uh, what was on the market so I decided to come over to Paso and start from scratch. Um, like everyone has said just very interesting people here in Paso, very helpful. Um, some of them have already moved out of the area, but quite a legacy of uh, vineyard work. Um, and they had the labor to, uh, to do all that. Certainly wineries were popping up like uh, pretty much like popcorn. So at any rate, that's kind of it in a nutshell, a uh, large nutshell, and uh, I'll, I'll wait for your questions or anything else. <laughs> no, it's you know, all good. Put something else in, Chris. Yeah, um, my daughter is the one. My daughter Caitlin is the one that took us downtown. That was her creativity, her insistence, and you know I'm not the marketer. She's the one that really represents our wine side business, and now has pretty much managed everything and is taking over the wine making duties. So she's the super girl. Doesn't wear red cape, but super girl. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so cool to hear. Uh, and we'll hopefully we'll see Caitlin's face here and at some point in time before we're all done uh, guys you you know your so let's talk about this a little bit more your winemaking first off what are we drinking that's what actually there was a, a, a thing there a second ago about hey what are you guys drinking so let me go ahead and share whoops wrong one <laughs> sorry everyone there it is um, that's what we're, we're drinking there. Hal, Hal threw two wines in, so we could have a white one as well. Um, and we'll get these guys to talk about the wines, but we've got this Rhone style, white Rhone style blend from Hal, uh, from Tackett family. Um, 
we'll get into that in a second as well. And a cab from over at Pianetta and Velatus looks like another blend of some sort. And we'll let them uh, go ahead and get into the detail of that. But what I first want to do is get each of you to talk a little bit about your military, your Navy background, and what has it done to help you in your now new career, this new thing that you're doing in wine. Um, Hal, let's start with you. Let's let what talk a little bit about that. I mean, you, you're kind of still in too, but. <laughs> you know, I, I am, I'm fortunate to not be in the Navy anymore, but I do a lot of work still uh, with the guys in the war. I still teach, I'm an F-35 uh, contract flight or contract instructor pilot there, uh, which, which does keep my fingers in the mix a little bit. But my, my background, I was an F-18 pilot, either Hornet or the Super Hornet. I uh, did that for just under 15 years. Uh, circumstances turned out that it was, it was advantageous to leave the Navy and come make crime make wine full time. Um, not, not advantageous economically, but advantageous lifestyle wise, of course. Um, and the, the transition, you know, folks always ask that when they either come in the tasting room or wherever they might be, you know, how, how do you go from some relatively high operational tempo military job to making wine? And, and I think, you know, I would guess that, that John and Leon would agree with this, that it's actually relatively similar because many of those, those high operational tempo jobs in the military, you are, you are trained to a specific process and standard and you, you learn how to do things at a, at a basic level, but at the same time, you are processing five or 600, maybe even a thousand different variables that are going on. And you're doing that at a very high rate of speed. So when, when things don't necessarily match your plan, you change it on the fly and, and you figure things out and you execute based on, on your training. And that's to some degree what we do in the wine business. You have a, a basic process from, from vineyard to bottle and you hope it goes according to your plan, but as we can, we can all tell you multiple stories, that, that never happens. And so you end up with all these different variables. You know, who thought, for example, that uh, we might get rain in, in Paso tonight at, at the end of May? I, I certainly didn't, but uh, it's still in the forecast right now. And, and we'll deal with that in the vineyard. Uh, so I, for me, I, I think it was an easy transition uh, that allowed us to take a process and a way of dealing, dealing with variables and, and have fun with it. And, and oh, by the way, I, I think most guys like us also tend to get bored fairly easily. And so if making wine was the exact same every single year, you know, vintage to vintage, grape to grape, I, I, I'd have been done with this in a year or two. But it's always exciting. It's always fun. And it's to some degree always a challenge. So over to, uh, to, to Leon to see if he agrees with me there, but I, that were pretty similar. No, totally. And, and to kind of pile on that too, it's different all year long. So you go from crush to, you know, to, you know, maintaining the winter, pruning into spring, you know, every, it's different all year long. And each year, like you said, is completely different. You just never know. All of a sudden you get, you know, bud break and tomorrow morning it's going to frost and you're like, oh, oh hell. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. What do you liken it to from things that you experienced while you were flying or, or, or what, what, you know, what you were doing at the time? Well, diving and stuff. I mean, it's all coordination and, yeah. and running. Um, you know, you've got harvest and you're trying to coordinate the, you know, bring the fruit in and, and, and making sure that everything's lined up and you've got everything line, you know, on tap that's supposed to be there. And if you're, if you're not going by that checklist, which, you know, you know, John and Hal will definitely back me up on this and the Navy lives and dies by checklist. So um, without it, you're, you're, you're smoked. So we definitely have that going for us. So keeping logs and log books, you know, it's like none of that's really changed that much. Yeah, that's definitely true. I've got some uh, pretty nasty Excel sheets that uh, Caitlin's always afraid to open, but uh, <laughs> right. back on what we do. <laughs> you know, in, in my case, I, uh, I flew A7s, uh, in the Navy and had a couple tours in Vietnam and um, the friends that I made over there and I'm sure Mike Roof is uh, listening. I, my roommate, my wingman, we've shared an awful lot of experiences together over there. It's, uh, 
it's almost like a second family. All those values I told you that they emphasized in uh, boot camp certainly uh, get magnified when you get operational. And the people that are operational, like Hal said, you just uh, you have to adjust. It just never goes like training. I mean, you think you know your your uh, mission and your plane when you leave the country, but boy, when you get in action, everything changes. And very much like uh, farming and winemaking. Um, and you know what? No one has talked about the money, but I'm going to go ahead and do it because we struggle. You always struggle as a farmer. I can remember getting wiped out in uh, in 05 and 80 percent wiped out in 05 from a freeze, a very hard freeze, first week of April. And then not a few years later, we get uh, a very hard freeze in the first week of December, like down to uh, 14 degrees for two days, certainly 17 for those four days. And I don't believe it got above freezing. And I lost 13 acres, replanted about uh, seven of it, uh, took six of it down to the graft and tried to bring it back. I uh, probably should have just replanted the whole 13 acres. And that was on the lower plateau, so it was a little bit cooler. So those are the things that you adjust to, and uh, very much like flying, you just don't know what's going to happen. you got to take it out on, on the roll and try to find money and keep your spirits up and keep going. <laughs> Luckily, I've got my daughter here who, uh, who kicks me in the ass. Well, oops, I'm sorry. Who kicks me in the pockets uh, once in a while to keep me going. And... Uh, She's, uh, she's God's in. I don't know that I'd be in it this long without her. Yeah, you know, um, you know uh, they always said it's here. Come on, come on, show your face. <laughs> there. You know, it's like they said at Sears School, if you've got a positive mental attitude, you can get through those small times, those tough times, and then you get back to good wine like, uh, and living. Yeah. Talk to I had hey, uh, so, to bring up Sears yeah. School. I know it's a brute. It, it, I don't like to do it. We're all laughing. <laughs> John mentioned that he uh, flew A7s. How about you guys? Can you talk quickly? What did you do in the Navy? Uh, I kind of forgot actually that that Leon, what you did, but go go first, please. Well, I was. Uh, it's called explosive ordnance disposal, but it's the military's bomb squad is what I did for the last 22. Um, I flew for a little while in, in the Navy. I was a crewman in helicopters for my first couple of years and then uh, transitioned over to being an EOD diver. So explosive ordnance disposal um, in the Navy is um, clearing sea mines, you know, diving up to 300 feet and uh, enabling access so the other troops can do their work, clearing, clearing the fields. Well, that's heavy. Uh, Hal? Uh, I just... Uh... Nothing as dangerous as either one riding in helicopters or uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I just I flew F 18s, Hornets, Super Hornets, uh, the carriers for quite uh, for about 15 years. And then talk the Top Gun School thing. I, I, I was fortunate to teach at, at Top Gun Navy Fighter Weapons School for about five years, uh, two separate tours, one as a lieutenant, one as a lieutenant commander, and that is a that is a life shaping experience. Is, uh, right. That's a good quick way to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I, I remember talking to uh, Hal during the practice session and uh, asked him how Fallon was. And he just said, it just hasn't changed. I mean, that camaraderie, uh, there was a place called Mom's Little Old Lady that loved the Navy guys, would uh, make things for us, uh, you know, something like mitten socks or shirts or whatever. And uh, cheap booze and, and a very cheap uh, craft table, but uh, it was a place to unwind, and it was a place for everyone to uh, talk about what they've been doing on the range. And you find, at least I did 50 years ago, that talking amongst yourselves away from the structure of the squadron, you learn a lot. Some things that you would probably say that you wouldn't say in the squadron, things that happened in the airplane, a mistake that you made, how you recovered. I mean, that's the kind of information that gets passed along over beer, and it could be life-saving. Uh, as Hal said, uh, you know, it's kind of a dangerous game to start with, and it can get even more dangerous if you don't pay attention and, uh, and not focus. 
Uh, I really can't talk much about what Leon did, but we'll get him going. It, it, it tastes a little more wine. <laughs> yeah, John, you'd be happy to know that Alan is the exact same way. And as we all know, so many amazing things, at least in the Navy, have been the result of guys getting together, uh, probably drinking too much and writing different things on a bar napkin somewhere. And also, as we know, that, that happens around Paso all the time. That was one of the first things that I saw. And Chris, you've seen that over at midnight where all of a sudden you'll have 15 different winemakers show up and where you're sharing wine and beer and other tasty beverages and everybody tells these stories and you all learn from, hey, how did you get your tractor stuck in the mud again today, Josie? Or how did you do this or that? Uh, same kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the camaraderie of, of Paso is super, super tight. Oh. It's always it's always fun to talk. It's always fun to put it on display here. Um, I don't know if this will work, but this is that's Fallon right there. That was Bravo range clearing off uh, Mark eighty two bombs that didn't go off that you guys were dropping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks, that looks like Bravo seventeen or Bravo twenty right there. I think it was 17, yeah. <laughs> okay, now it's going to get good, Leon. You know, some of those bombs we dropped were not meant to explode. You know That's that. That's right. <laughs> and I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, fusing that was in the back end of those things. Oh, yeah, FMU 134 Bravos. Well, I want to say we call it a DSC 36, which was oh, a DS magnetic mine that we would seed roads and rivers with. But when you we just... dropped the string... There were bombs going off, and then, of course, there were these seeds that we were planting, and, uh, you know, they thought they'd uh, go in and start driving around the holes and all of a sudden blow up. We had a few Yeah, that's, you, you mentioned the one fuse that, that runs shivers up in the EOD Tech spine, that DST. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that was pretty classified at the time. I hope I didn't break, uh, break something. But nah, that's it's, that's... Long ago, but yeah, you didn't I'm want to sure see that little gold emblem. Better than that, 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we don't use those anymore, so. No, <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> you know, I do want to tie all this uh, together. We enjoy, uh, Caitlin enjoys the friends that I've had in the military. They come to the tasting room, they come to the ranch. Um, I even had an enlisted guy who was in my division, recognized the face, didn't recognize the name, came up to the ranch, had all these pictures, gave me a challenge coin. Obviously, he didn't look like he was 50 years ago, but this is the kind of camaraderie that uh, is developed in the Navy, and uh, boy, you sure as hell enjoy it in the later years, especially if you have some wine to offer. Speaking of wine, Go Let's right. get into that. Let's get into that. Let's start with the first, uh, the, the white wine from Volatus. It's called Cavu, which has a meaning, uh, and it is a blend. And uh, get into that. Yeah, while you're, while you're showing that, Chris, it, it's Cavu, and most of what we do is aviation-based. So ceiling, ceiling and visibility unlimited. It's a, it's a perfect bluebird day, a uh, great day to go flying. And this one happens to be, yeah, this one happens to be Viognier and Roussan coming from the Caliza Vineyard uh, over on Anderson Road. Uh, Carl making some incredible wines, growing some amazing fruit, along with Andy helping him out in the vineyard. And it's good stuff. Yeah, it was, it was delicious. I got to tell you. Yeah, on the... Hal, I've got a question for you on the, uh, on the blend. I know Viognier is kind of a hot weather grape. How does Roussan uh, grow around here? You know, we're, um, it's interesting where, where Carl's Vineyard is over at Caliza. It's actually relatively cool there. And so what the Viognier does there, it's known as a grape. Obviously, it's going to develop a huge amount of sugar. And you can get some very high alcohol wines. Even if you look at some of the modern uh, Condru coming out of the Northern Rhone Valley, they're 15 plus percent alcohol. And, and this one's no different than that. But we also, uh, in Carl's climate and the, the, the the soils he has at the Caliza Vineyard uh, it retains a huge amount of acidity. And so we'll get these big uh, 27, 28 bricks type of Viognier's, but they're going to be sitting there at about a 335 pH. And in terms of the Roussan, we, we, Roussan tends to be a little bit lower acid grape. So we blend the Roussan in there to, to dial that Viognier down a little bit. And, and it, also mod, it also modulates a little bit the, uh, some of the, you can get very tropical, very white floral. 
and the Rusan at Carl's place is just it's super earthy and round and fun. It really, I think, blends relatively well. Yeah, we find uh, when we do some blending, we pay attention to the acids too, having one kind of tone the other down. And, uh, and the big thing, I guess, all you guys are mentioning is that you really don't want to mess with Mother Nature too much. You, you let her give you uh, what she's going to give you that year and then do what you can with it. And I think it's very wise that you guys are, are blending according to the, to the vintage, which is cool. So John, Critical, talking, huh? why don't you talk a little bit about this red wine that we have in front of us, uh, Altitude. That's a damn good wine, Cal. I'm going to go come over and buy some. <laughs> um, Altitude is a, um, uh, where is it? Here we go. Altitude is a blend of uh, Cabernet and uh, Petit Syrah. Uh, made it back in 14. Uh, Caitlin uh, brought it back in 18. Uh, we've been playing with uh, Petit Syrah uh, blends, and this one uh, turned out pretty good. You, you change the percentage a little bit each year, but uh, as we have kind of con concluded, uh, every year is different, so we don't always uh, have a reserve. We don't always make the same blend if you don't have a good uh, component. Uh, you know, blending can mask uh, errors, but uh, boy, if you are just multiplying quality blending is phenomenal so uh, this i think the two grapes are compatible um, everyone's got a different flavor palette but uh, uh, i'm a cab lover so the cabernet and then uh, petite syrah is uh, <laughs> it's so dark it'll stay in your thoughts so when you get blend it you have to kind of uh, not overpower the other wine. Cabernet is such a strong uh, wine. It's really fun to blend with. It's a delicious wine. This and the, the acid is definitely uh, really prominent in this wine. It's you know I'm going to say something else, uh, and and you guys can uh, can chime in. But uh, one of our successes, I think, is uh, our barreling. And Caitlin has really uh, gotten into uh, the woods. Uh, she does the buying, she does the blending. She's got a real, she won't release it yet, but she's got one hell of a reserve uh, Cabernet, just based on nothing but blending woods. Uh, oh, in particular, the uh, altitude was on Hungarian oak, one new barrel and one very used barrel. So uh, we find that uh, Kayla makes up the, uh, the barrel recipes now. So it, it's very interesting to take your strong grapes and put a little more wood on it. Take your weaker grapes, put a little less wood. There's the tannins in the grape, as you know, and the tannin and the barrel kind of uh, come together. So that's kind of the fun and complex part. And of course, I'm sure you guys do it, but we track every barrel in our, uh, in our program, every usage and um, it gets to be uh, complex, but fun. That's really small too. Thank you for sharing it. That's that's pretty awesome. Appreciate that. So, you, can, you can really taste that Hungarian oak in here. And what we oh. find is that a lot of, uh, we make that with, with Rich at Midnight Cellars, a lot of our clients really enjoy that pairing. And I think it shows well here of Hungarian oak with Petit Syrah by itself or in a blend. Yeah. It does some really cool things. You know, that, uh, that kind of came on strong a few years ago, and we, we got turned on to it, and then all of a sudden Gallo bought a, uh, a big lot of Hungarian oak. Uh, but you're right, when you start blending uh, Hungarian with some good Frenches, we even have some Russian and uh, a little bit of American, but we prefer tighter grain, so we like the Europeans. Any American oak we get, I prefer from cold, well, cold weather country where the grain's a little bit tighter and the tannin's a little softer and the, and the barrel's a little bit longer, meaning it takes a little more time for the barrel to cure the wine. And then to take and, and, uh, and I mean, the oldest barrel in our winery is an 07. And as long as it's still healthy, um, we use that neutrality to, uh, to cure some of the wines that, uh, you know, Sandra Daisy uh, will always put in every program a neutral barrel in order to accentuate the, the flavor. And that's what uh, Russian oak does. It really brings out the flavor in the wine. And Hungarian oak adds a little spice to it. As you know, French is, uh, is uh, 
the tighter uh, little vanilla tannins and the slow extract, but geez, it, it's fun to work with that stuff. And, and uh, you know, you can barrel taste one day and two to three weeks later, come back to the same barrels and it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Leon, I see you're pouring your wine, and so probably a good transition to talk a little bit about that. But before you do, we had a question over on Facebook um, about the uh, Warrior Foundation through Tackett Family Vineyards. I guess you're doing yep. a, um, a fundraising effort on that. Can you talk a little bit about that before we talk about your wine? Sure. So, I mean, I mentioned earlier that I was EOD in the Navy, so we have a little foundation called the EOD Warrior Foundation. And about nine years ago, we started making a label um, that specifically supported them. Just happened to have the hat on, EOD Sellers. Um, and a small little group, you know, supports all four services. And um, we do, usually in April, not this year, unfortunately, would have been our ninth annual event uh, fundraiser. But as we all know, it was canceled. But we are doing another one in November um, out at our place. We're going to do a bike ride this year. So we've teamed up with... Uh, Cal Coast Brewing, and we're going to start there at Cal Coast on Friday night, the 13th of November, and then roll into our place on the 14th of November, and uh, we'll have the foundation out. We'll have a lot of bike riding going on. We're going to do some trail rides on the work ranch. We're going to do some hikes on the work ranch, and just sit back, have a lot of fun, and raise some money for the, for the foundation. What was the name of the foundation again? EOD Warrior Foundation. Okay. Does that include the teams also? Not SEAL team, no, just EOD. Okay. Yep. And we've got, uh, got this line up. Tackett Cask 6-3. That must have a meaning behind it. Yeah, it's, uh, so my wife and I are both uh, vintage 1963, so we thought we'd have some fun with the label with it. And uh, threw that out there this year. It's a, it's a new label for us just playing around, having some fun with it. It's one of the nice things about being a small little winery. You get to play around and have fun with uh, with your label. So um, yeah, Cab, Petit Verdot, and uh, and Merlot on this one. So nice. two different vineyards, actually three different vineyards. Um, close to San Miguel for the Petit Verdot and the Cab, and then, or I mean the Merlot and the Cab, and then the Petit Verdot came out farther in the Independence Ranch area. So it's a lot, of, it's a real fun blend really works well together. It, it is a blend. We were we were talking before we started about Petit Verdot and, and what, quite honestly, what an amazing grape it can be here in Paso as a blender or even by itself. Um, it, you know, originally in one of, one of the five Bordeaux varieties, and typically you'll find it there and there's like this two to five percent a year. It, we could do it a hundred percent. I don't do one, but I think, Leon, you do a hundred percent? We do a hundred percent Petit Verdot and this particular one's right around 25% on this and 25 Merlot and then 50 cab. So rough numbers, but. Wow. But that's I'm definitely going to talk to you. Like I said, we've got some Petit Verdot coming in and uh, I was on the tractor the other day and uh, you know, I noticed that it was uh, somewhat loaded, smaller bunches, uh, but from in the first two years, I, I <laughs> wasn't sure the plants were going to make it. And yeah. this year we really, uh, they really look good. And we have about 11 and a quarter inches of rain, which is good for us. Uh, we're in kind of a little hot part of the valley up there in Indian Valley. And uh, cab grows great there. Uh, no matter what's happened to us, our cab just seems to always be uh, good quality. Never going to get qu uh, quantity out of it, uh, but we've always uh, enjoyed good quality out of it. So hopefully uh, that area, and, and I'll be talking to you about uh, the deeper note. And then we plan to Syrah, which we really like. Yeah, it might be a little later than the rest. It has a tendency to be a late ripener, but, um, you know, I know that the stuff I'm looking at right now, it's already, you know, halfway through bloom and starting to fruit set now. So we should be yeah. getting close. So see how it plays out. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting uh, point that you bring up. Wine definitely follows its birthright. So if the grape is, uh, uh, is late, it appears that the wine kind of follows that same pattern. Everything goes dormant in the wintertime, including wine. Uh, it doesn't mean it goes dead. It just means that its uh, biologic and chemical activity slow down. 
And so the very first time I was faced with that, uh, I got real nervous. We were doing everything we could to our uh, San Giovese that came in in November, trying to rush it through. And uh, yeah, I was talking to every guru I could. Uh, and basically all of them said, keep the faith. They've had wine in fermentation as long as eight months. And I sat back and I went, shit, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> But you know what? It turned out great. Uh, it was our 18, and uh, we went back uh, to the same source at 19. Same things happening, only I get sleep at night. <laughs> I don't lose sleep over it. Yeah, we actually, I did a label a couple of years ago with another winemaker, actually three or four years ago here, Adam Lazar, and we called it Espera, which is, uh, to me, which means to wait. <laughs> so we, we do a lot of that in the wine industry for sure. By the way, Hal, you didn't explain what uh, volatus means in Latin. Wow, John, very, uh, not you on throw out that uh, lingo. <laughs> uh, you know, volatus in Latin, or volatus, uh, you can say it pretty much however, it's a 2,000 year old dead language, so who really knows? But uh, volatus means flight or flying. Cool. Because uh, mo most of what we do is aviation. Uh, I would be remiss though, my, my wife would probably, uh, smack me around a little bit later. If I didn't mention that we do most of our wines aviation, and then we do some of our wines that are music based, because uh, much like, uh, John, you have a tremendous assistant there helping. Uh, Victoria helps me behind the scenes. and Her family, they're all musicians. So Victoria's dad is a drummer in a band called Supertramp. Uh, her uncle is a, was the lead guitarist in a band called Thin Lizzy. So we do, we do a couple wines based on those, but most things are, are the Velocius brand of, uh, of wine. Geez, Hal, you got the better part of both worlds. You got music and you can drink wine, and how happy can you get for crying out loud? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, John, I'm a very fortunate man. I, I'm the first person. <laughs> <laughs> and then Leon plays the guitar. Uh, at least that's what he's got in the background. <laughs> would appear yeah, they just, they're, they're for show, you know, the saying. <laughs> good. good, good. <laughs> The wall art, don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I don't do really anything do fun, guys. <laughs> I don't know. They look pretty well used. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Leon, tell us about Tackett. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris, that's your lead. <laughs> <laughs> no, all good. Leon, I think you covered uh, Cask 6 3, uh, but. Uh, how actually the uh, the Malbec that was you know, the the late ad or maybe it was the original ad I'm not sure uh, talk a little bit about that Malbec where did it come from and what went into that wine uh, sure so this this is it is 100% Malbec uh, that has traditionally been my favorite grape and until very recently and I've switched over to uh, Tanat is my new favorite but uh, th this Malbec is actually from the Seven Angels Vineyard. Uh, over on Templeton Road, uh, just beyond Highway 101, uh, mm -hmm. South Side Templeton, and it is—it's interesting. It's actually two separate picks from the same vineyard, about six weeks apart. Uh, we've got 50% uh, French oak on here, which I, I've never been a huge fan of, of too much oak on Malbec, but this one was it was big enough and acidic enough that it needed a bit of oak. Um, and this is the first time we've done a varietal. It typically goes into our top 10 cuvee blend, but in, in 18, we had quite a bit. So I uh, called a couple buddies over in Lemoore. The name of this wine is High Hat, and it is named after the oldest fighter squadron in the name. So going way back to 1919, the, uh, the High Hat squadron, and, and that there, the hat in the red circle, was the logo they had on the airplanes back in 1919 to 19, roughly 1930. Uh, and so we, we pushed out a couple label design ideas to the, uh, all of the current squadron, as well as going back probably 50 years with different top hatters. Uh, with top hatters, that is the current name of the squadron. And everybody gave us their opinion and we, we threw it on a bottle and I think the wine's pretty fun. So it's, uh, it's a delicious Malbec. John, yeah, were you in that squadron? squadron? <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> uh, I wanted to apologize, Chris and Hal. Yeah. 
I uh, am the oldest member of this panel, so I already forgot that we talked about Tackett. I was really looking at Hal when I said Leon, <laughs> and as you guys can attest to the practice session, I'm interchanging you guys. So, now that I've uh, <clears throat> exposed myself, what do you think of the eye bar in Coronado? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Never been there. <laughs> Chris, you haven't been there? Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't, Chris probably hasn't been there, but I've been there. It's I've been there. You guys the personal tour uh, conducted by a two star admiral. How's that? Very nice. Definitely. You ever run across uh, Admiral Mercer, Hal? You know, I don't think I ever did, sir. He was. Uh, well, he was my squadron mate in uh, 195, and then a uh, very illustrious career um, was the skipper of the uh, Carl Vinson, and uh, still very active in the military uh, like yourself, uh, but a very dynamic man, and can't say enough about the friends that I have from that era, and I'm sure you guys have uh, the same, and it's just... Uh, it's phenomenal. It's uh, great to have a second family. Uh, and I'll be a little bit prejudiced here of Navy guys. I even have a very good friend who spent six years in the Hilton. And uh, you'd never know it. This guy's got one of the greatest attitudes and he's a motivation. <laughs> okay, this is my, uh, my daughter uh, writing questions. Uh, do you think Gwartstraminer <laughs> oh, for Leon, excuse me. Yep. Is Gwartschmeiner as good as your grandfather's? Oh, <laughs> Very quick. Uh, it's, it's, it's better. You know, my, my, unfortunately, my grandfather passed away a few years after he planted those grapes. So we only got one or two vintages out of them. But uh, yeah, and it's uh, affectionately known as girls are meaner. So you can, Caitlin, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I agree. I mean, my grandfather used to make wine, and hopefully I'm making wine better than his. Although, <laughs> on cruise, the guys really liked my grandfather's medicine. Never had booze on a ship, but we had an awful lot of medicine. A lot uh, of my gra grandfather was retired warrant, army warrant, so, you know, we won't hold it against him. But, yeah, he was a little rough when it comes to... <laughs> Jesus was proud of you. We're talking damn near 100 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> There's got to be some improvement since then. Right. By the way, Al, very nice wine. I really like it. Thank you. Oh, delicious. Yeah, look. And kudos, John, on here. Good, good stuff. I don't know, Chris. I think you stacked the deck. Um, I'm going to have to visit these guys, and if it wasn't for my daughter, I wouldn't know if anyone existed uh, outside the ranch. But, uh, <laughs> well, well, Kate, we love that, that. Thank you for we love that picture of you on the tractor. 14. How's that for a politically correct answer? <laughs> 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 I need to get out. I'm, I'm, uh, Caitlin is reducing my load, so I'm going to take advantage of that, get off the tractor and out of the winery. Is <laughs> you guys? I would really appreciate that. I I definitely see a future wine festival panel uh, with you three and and a few others. I think at some point in time, this has been really fun. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what else you get because everyone is hearing you know the three wines, but Leon, you've you've got a, plenty of other wines that you do. Is there something though? Is that I mean, is that your flagship or what is what would you consider being your kind of flagship wine? Probably our, between our Petite Syrah and our Gewurz both um, that we do. And, you know, these two guys here will understand. We have another wine that we call Bravo Zulu, um, which in the Navy means well done. So, you know, wine well done. And it's uh, quite popular. It's a Barbera Zinfandel blend. And it, uh, it does really well out there. So, yeah, a lot of fun for sure. Yeah, I think we used that wine uh, not long ago for something or another, I, I believe. Um, you know, know, that's interesting how we have taken some of our Navy heritage into the modern wine. I don't know if any of you guys realize, you know, Caitlin's got a pilot's license and a lot of this marketing is, uh, is her ingenuity. And uh, we might have to do some more of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he just said what Bravo Zulu means. Very good. Kudos. Kudos. Well done. 
Well done. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. well done. And hey, now we're going to bring her up to uh, speed on the Navy jargon. <laughs> Without a doubt, uh, we, we, we can do that. M most of it is uh, most of it's suitable for this uh, publication, I guess. Chris, you've made this very fun. I, uh, I was very reluctant. I didn't know what to expect, but uh, whatever my daughter uh, asked me to do, I do it. Reluctantly, <laughs> but I do it. <laughs> That's why I emailed her. I didn't email you. I emailed her. <laughs> Sierra Hotel. There you go. You all know what that is. Right, Chris? No. <laughs> you hung around Hal long enough? That's because Hal's politically correct. I mean, shit, I. <laughs> John, John, that hurts right there. That hurts. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I can see this guy. We're going to get together. I guarantee that. <laughs> yes, I might even get my roommate from New York out here. <laughs> we, we could have a pretty good time. I think we could have a damn good time. <laughs> right on you guys. Definitely. John, uh, I once had Caitlin on a panel uh, talking about uh, kind of some family history and second generation. And one of the things that she brought up was growing up in an Italian family. A lot of your wines are also some of the Italian varieties that are available in Paso. Talk a little bit about some of these other wines that, that you're also making. And then Hal, we're going to go to you next on, on some of the other wines that you're, you're making too before we wrap things up. Go, John. Well, uh, and, and that's actually in Caitlin's territory, but we do make a Sangiovese and a Barbera. We've started blending with uh, Sangiovese. Our Tuscan Nights is a uh, Cabernet Sangiovese Petit Syrah blend. Um, and, you know, <laughs> as far as family history and Italians, uh, I'm surprised that I haven't used my hands more. I mean, you all know how to uh, gag an Italian. You handcuff them. So uh, the Italians uh, have earned their reputation, very heartfelt, very, uh, uh, they put themselves out front. And if they take a hit, tough shit, we keep going. Uh, that's expected. Uh, and as you know, Hal, there's no slack in uh, light attack. So uh, I've definitely got uh, the shit from, you know, being Italian, being in the Navy. And, it's just an awful lot of camaraderie that parallels Italian and uh, the Navy. Uh, yeah. What do you want? Very true. And winemaking, yeah, excuse me, yeah. I think we ought to put Caitlin on here. I mean, I'm blabbering here. <laughs> you, know, you know, John, you, I mean, you've got kind of like the perfect storm because it's the Italian side plus the, the, the pilot side. So I'm really surprised you haven't done any of this yet. How I'm not a fighter pilot, you know that. I'm attacked. No one knows what the hell that is, and I'm not going to describe it. But uh, I was very proud to admit that I had a MIG shot off my ass by a Navy cruiser and encountered a, I didn't encounter him, but I saw him, he saw me, and he broke off, and I was tired, so I went home. <laughs> that, uh, did, Red, did Red Crown start uh, screaming at you when you, or, uh, did you, did you get calls from Red Crown when they were shooting, or did you just see the missile going overhead? You know, Hal, in all honesty, the only call we got was from the ship that said, oh, by the way, there's MiGs in the area. Our fighters have gone home because they're out of gas, and you're on your own. And uh, we just went feet wet, and sure enough, right up there was a MiG-21. And, uh, you know, we get... Bug fever, I wanted to turn in and shoot, and by George, uh, he pulled off, and I went, eh, sign to go home. <laughs> you're out of gas and ideas, and you're down low. Yeah, you're usually a bad place to be. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, um, I think about it often. You're not in combat without it affecting your life. I, uh, it's a very uh, narrow club. And uh, my roommate, who's uh, watching this and participating, very loyal wine club member, has made the trek out from New York just for a couple of events that we have at the winery. Wonderful reunions. I've gone out to him. It is just a camaraderie that I wish the rest of the people in this country could somehow tap into. 
Yeah, we're, we're pretty fortunate. And well even, said, John. Well said. And even cross, uh, kind of cross-discipline within the Navy, it, it, I think it's the same way, whether it's the EOD guys, the uh, spec war guys, the, the surface guys, even if you spend any time on a submarine, which is absolutely crazy. But it's there. there's something, okay. I'm very Navy biased, but we kind of do everything. And it, there's something special about it. And you get this incredible camaraderie that lasts the remainder of your life. And it, it's a special thing. You know, I, and I don't know if we're running out of time, but I'm going to add a quick one. Uh, I have two sons that are in the Navy. Uh, one was a Flyboy P3s. Tell Chris we're going to share what? We're going to share a screen, I guess. I don't know. Oh, John, you're awesome. <laughs> At any rate, I've got a son who's about ready to take command of a uh, attack submarine, the Santa Fe, and my other son, the oldest one. Uh, here we go. Oh, this is a great one. Yeah, no wonder Caitlin wanted to say share screen. This was an air show back in Lemoore. I was uh, divorced at the time and uh, took my, my kids to an air show to show them what dad kind of did. And look at the boots, look at the kids, look at the uh, grin on their face. Uh, this is what it's all about, folks. Um, Love the Navy shirt. <laughs> Straight up Navy shirt. But anyway, we Very kind of cool. have a Navy family, and Caitlin is definitely part of it, even though she wasn't in the military. Uh, she is even better than that. I'm sorry to say, but my sons are just government employees. <laughs> I went. Oh, JT's watching. I'm not apologizing, JT. You're just a government employee. You know what's neat? <laughs> All the things my, my P3 son did, I it actually warms my heart. He was a shooter on the Roosevelt. That's the guy that launches the airplanes. <laughs> And I loved his stories. I loved the camaraderie. His heart was right there on the planes that he was shooting. So uh, my hats off to my uh, whole family. They've done well. I'm very proud of them. And uh, I'm very thankful, Chris, for you bringing uh, uh, the Jerry, Hal, and Leah. I'm sure there's going to be an ongoing friendship here because that's the way the Navy works. Absolutely. Right. Cheers, you guys. That's awesome. John, Chris, thank you so much. Thank you. We are just about out of time. And so, <laughs> hey, Chris, comments too. Last comment on Zoom chat. Yeah. <laughs> like I should have known. I know what that is, Hal. <laughs> That's why my daughter's thank you. there pushing buttons. I just push the drink and talk, which is pretty much what the Navy does. That, and that's what this show is, actually, to be perfectly honest, is drinking and talking and somehow sort of talking about something, actually. Thank you. I'd guys. like to get you guys all up at the ranch and uh, do some barrel tasting. Right on. We'll do that for sure. I'm in. I'm totally in with all these guys. Uh, yeah. Hal, Leon, John, first off, thank you for your service. Thank you so much for what you have done to help keep this country free and just I appreciate you guys so much coming on with me uh, this has been really fun it's been really entertaining <laughs> I love hearing these stories actually I got to be honest I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you tell a story I kind of forget I'm actually like doing this show and supposed to be actually like keeping things going because I just kind of listen on in I dive in so thank you for your stories as well uh, appreciate everyone being a part of this and, and listening in. We will have another show on Wednesday. Go to PasaWine.com to see what show is coming up next. Uh, but we've got a few more shows that are going to be Wednesdays and Fridays, and then we're going to be switching to a Thursday once a week uh, show. I got some left. So, cheers, everyone. Appreciate it. Right on. You. See ya. Good night, all.